Lenny, and I'm the project coordinator in staff and organization development here at the Chicago Public Library. And I'd like to begin by thanking Deborah Page Jackson and Fallon White for being part of the Women's History Committee and for arranging and producing this evening's event. So, Betty Friedan wrote a book called The Feminine Mystique. It was the first popular book about the inequities between men and women in home and in the workplace. Betty um, subtitled her book The Problem That Has No Name because she felt that many women were very unhappy and dissatisfied with their lives in the 50s and early 60s, even though a lot of them were married and had creature comforts. There was something that wasn't quite right. Um, this contrasted sharply to the pictures depicted of women in the 30s and 40s who were always seen as competent, confident, and independent. Betty's research showed her that women would feel more fulfilled if they took on jobs that used their entire mental facilities. Then in the spring of 1972, Gloria Steinem and others published the first issue of Ms. Magazine, when that term, Ms., was new to the populace. The first cover depicted a woman with eight outstretched arms trying to balance every facet of her life from work and at home all at the same time. And then in 2013, Cheryl Sandberg wrote Lean In, a book that encourages women to take big risks, big leaps, to ask for big opportunities and to work on strategies to overcome the obstacles that are going to be in their way. During the 50 years between Betty's book and Cheryl's book, the wages between men and women still remain inequitable. Women currently earn 77 cents on every dollar a man makes, and over the course of her working life, a college-educated woman will earn $713,000 less than her male counterpart. 16.9% of the Fortune 500 companies currently have women on their corporate board. And less than 5% of those same Fortune 500 companies have women CEOs. So it's clear things have not changed as much as we would have liked. So let's talk about what we can do to correct these inequities by having our panelists introduce themselves, tell you about their lives, their work, and how they lean in. And we're going to start with Kathy. Yes, thank you. I'm Kathy McClure of McClure Publishing. I decided to lean in and become the president of my own company. And what I really like about it is I reach people around the world and I help authors become international authors. We publish books and distribute them around the world. It's so interesting because I'm running the company and I am the one who is setting the law of the company. And sometimes when you deal with customers who are men and women, you see the difference between the two and you learn how to deal with all of them. I really appreciate what I'm doing because it helps me to read more and to learn more and to study more. And it helps me to get out and meet wonderful people like you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kelly Stanley. And if you've read the book, you would remember the term career-loving parent, and I feel that's exactly what I am. I'm a career-loving mother of two, and I am a certified financial planner, and I work for a small financial planning firm in the Beverly neighborhood of Chicago. And what I do is I specialize in helping newly independent women uh, kind of take control over their finances as they're entering a new transition in their life. So whether they've gone through a divorce or they've lost their spouse, um, or maybe they've just inherited a lot of money and they're just not familiar with having all this money to deal with. So I help take them, take them through these difficult transitions. And um, prior to that, I was working for uh, uh, two different companies, but I was in the corporate finance world for seven and a half years. And I've been doing this now for uh, about five and a half years. And uh, I guess how I've leaned into my career, I'm, I'm in uh, the position to be taking over the firm within the next year and a half. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a scary thought, but I'm very excited about it. Well, my name is Halima Nash, and I am currently the uh, CEO of my own firm, which is called Legacy Venture Consulting. It's a sports philanthropy firm uh, where I consult professional athletes on charitable ventures. 
And um, the way that I lean in uh, is, you know, interestingly enough, uh, in the introduction, she talked about uh, the, the wonderful part about uh, lean in is it talking about taking risks um, and being willing to dive out there when it's really scary to be a woman in in everyday industries, regardless of whether it's a male-dominated industry or whether it isn't, uh, it can be a very difficult thing being a, a female executive. And I worked in professional sports. I worked at the Chicago Bulls for five years, and then you know before that, I was at Duke University at working with the basketball team. And that's a very difficult industry to maintain your tenacity to be a leader in, I should say. And the way that I leaned in is, you know, deciding to take all of those wonderful lessons that I learned through the adversity of uh, being a diverse personality in that industry and starting my own firm uh, and hiring women, mm -hmm. hiring mothers, uh, encouraging young women that are interested in professional sports uh, to take that leap, take that risk, and showing them how to do so. Uh, and then being able to tailor the message of a very male-dominated industry to multiple communities, whether it's urban communities, corporate communities, international communities, just kind of breaking down those boundaries. I'm really excited about being here on this panel of powerhouse women uh, <laughs> today. Thank you. And Cassandra. All right. Well, I'm Cassandra, diva of Dialogue Lee, and I've built a career around using divine inspiration vocally applied by teaching through speaking. My life is centered around educating and empowering individuals to reach their, their success, whatever that may be. One of the key things that I had to learn regarding leaning in was that leaning in means change, and meaning change sometimes even for yourself. I'm coaching and I'm teaching and I'm training and facilitating workshops for individuals around the nation and I'm teaching them to change and in 2010 I had to lean in and do the same for myself. <laughs> you know, do a little bit of rebranding, you know, do a little bit of soul searching and I really, really connected with Sheryl Sandberg's book in a lot of ways where one of the key things that we were asked how do we lean in? And I say that sitting at the table was something I had to learn in my eight year career as an administrative assistant and something I still do today as president and sponsor and mentor of the Wrightwood Ashburn Overcomers Toastmasters Club. I also work with mentors. I am a mentor today where many of my Toastmaster members are here in the audience that I actually mentor. So I'm giving back in that way. And then I also had to learn trading likability for respectability. That was something very key throughout my career as an administrative assistant. There was an instance where I started a position within the first two weeks, my coworker didn't like me. She didn't know me, but she didn't like me. Yet I had to learn with her for the year that I worked with her, let's respect each other, even if you hate my guts. <laughs> and we were able to do that. And one final thing that I learned from Cheryl that I realized that I was doing and that was, she called it navigating the jungle gym. I didn't realize that's what I was doing in my career as administrative assistant, into my career as an entrepreneur, and now as a career advancement strategist. And finally, I say I have to put on my rhinestone combat boots every day. <laughs> because it's a struggle out there, as all these ladies have all said. I love that. Thank you. start asking some very detailed questions. And the first one deals with aspirations. What influenced your thinking about what you could accomplish? You know, other women want to chime in on the obstacle path. Cassandra? Yeah, I, as I was listening to Kelly provide her answer, one of the key things that I thought about for myself with aspirations, I knew when I was six years old that I wanted to teach because I discovered notebook paper. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom so upset with me when I found that 500 sheet pack of notebook paper and I turned it to 1,000 sheets because I ripped it in half and put it in my notebook so I could have more paper. But I knew I wanted to teach. One of the key obstacles though that I realized I had to get around was initially teachers who would tell me that I could do something other than teach. And when I was in grade school, I remember one of my teachers saying, you're so you can be anything that you want to be. Why do you want to teach? And I looked at her and I said, because you're my favorite teacher. <laughs> it internalized for her in that moment. And she said, well, I want you to consider something else that you could do. Now, she doesn't know at this point that I am a teacher as an entrepreneur. 
See, during that time, she thought I would take the teacher route the traditional way, mm -hmm. whereas I still connected to my passion and formed a career around my passion, yet I found a way to do it in an entrepreneurial sense. And that was the biggest challenge that I remember immediately that I had to face was teachers telling me that I shouldn't teach because mm -hmm. they thought I could do so much more. Thank you. Okay, so all of you are successful women. What do you attribute your success to? Is it luck? Is it being in the right place at the right time? Is it hard work, perseverance? Why do you think so many women deny their own accomplishments? So first let's start with, how did you become successful? Was it luck? I'm gonna start with Helena. Oh, um, you know, this is an excellent question and you know, it's kind of hard to answer it one way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how you, uh, what you attribute your success to. You know, this book is, you know, Women Work and the Will to Lead. And I think that that will is such a huge part of, of being successful. Because, you know, I've always learned that, you know, we can sit on these panels and, you know, we could surround ourselves with all these wonderful women that can teach us how to succeed. Uh, but the bigger lesson is how to fail um, because failure is going to come. You have to have a will that's larger than any failure, than any obstacle, than any level of, of, of adversity that you face. Because again, you know, being women in the workplace, being a mother, you know, taking care of your kids and balancing work hours and now, you know, getting ready to become a CEO, daring to be a teacher, publishing works that is daring because everyone isn't willing to do it, you know, but you're willing to put your brand into it and all the things that these women are doing. Um, I think it takes will. It takes a lot of willpower, which, you know, is so eloquently uh, detailed in, in the book. But, uh, you know, for me, when I hear the word luck, it's, it's interesting. I've always been told that, uh, you know, success is when, uh, you know, preparation meets opportunity, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you can have something that falls in your lap, but if you're not prepared for it, if you're not ready for it, then it's gonna be a missed opportunity. Uh, so, you know, for me, working it for the MBA was, was a difficult period of time uh, because I'm a woman and I'm an African-American woman and I'm attractive so all of those things in a male-dominated industry says that, you know, it says certain things, you know, that, that speaks to some people that maybe I just want to be around professional athletes, right? Or maybe, you know, like I'm not that smart because pretty girls can't be smart, right? You know, like, you know, all of these d misconceptions that are completely inaccurate and not true that you have to fight against, but that willpower says that I'm going to be prepared, I'm going to conquer whatever darts are thrown at me because I am willing to lead. I have the will to lead. And having that kind of willpower can really lead you to successful places because I could have said, you know what, I don't like the way that people think about me in this industry. I'm going to jump to another one. You know, or I don't really like the way that people perceive me in some of these spaces. You know, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Instead, I reframe that to say, you might not believe in me, you might not think I'm smart, you might not think I'm prepared, you might not think I'm ready, but the work that I produce, if it doesn't convince you, it at least puts me in a position where I am grabbing hold of wonderful opportunities at every juncture, and that led me to become a CEO of my own company. Thank you. Okay, so in the book she talks about challenges, and obviously all of us have met challenges on a daily basis, but what challenge in your life taught you how to lean in? And did you kind of lean back from a challenge when you were first presented with it? And how did you overcome that so you could lean in? And we're gonna start with Kathy. Great, great, that is really a wonderful question because I'm challenged in what I'm doing as a publisher. I'm a math major. A student in math, tutoring students in college on how to divide polynomials, <laughs> a, phys <laughs> physics, anything with equations was what I was doing. I would dream theorem, and I would come to school the next day, and I would ask the teacher when he started with the theorem, can I finish it? And he says, well, at the end, how did I know? I dreamt it the night before. <laughs> so to come into an area of words and English I failed English so many times. <laughs> I had to take four remedial English classes before I got to 101 in college. So that tells you what I'm doing. I can't get any kind of honor or glory for it because it has to be something inside of me that's bigger than I am that's doing this for me. 
it took me a long time to figure out about a noun and a pronoun <laughs> and, and a verb and how a noun and a verb must agree. When the teacher said about a noun is a person, place, or thing, I could not comprehend it. I wanted the teacher to say that the place is Chicago, the thing is a book, and a person is Kathy. <laughs> then I could have comprehend that, but for some reason it just kept going over my head, and I just couldn't grab it. I'm a wonderful storyteller, so that's what's good about being in the industry that I am in, because telling stories capture the minds of the people, and you draw them in, and then all of a sudden you bring them to the end of the punchline, and they're like, oh, and I might even throw a twist in there. So I really know that this is a challenge for me. And so I don't take it as it's something that's lightly. I really get into it. I have all these books I refer to. I don't roll anything out until I check all the things on the checklist before <laughs> anything goes out. So challenges are good. You know, if we do everything that we know how to do, then we won't put forth that effort. And the challenge has become a thing in me that I'm passionate now for it. I wake up to it, I go to bed to it all day long. If you call me on the phone, we're talking about books. One of my <laughs> friends told me, Kathy, we're going in here to have lunch and we're not gonna talk about books. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now it's a part of me, it became a part of me. And I stumble, I fall, but I get back up and I dust myself off and keep on going. For the rest of you, what lessons could you pass on to another woman about taking risks? Uh, you know, I, I had an opportunity uh, over the summer to volunteer in a park district. Mm -hmm. And it was a really great analogy for taking risks because I watched while I was in there, children take swimming lessons and adults take swimming lessons. Yes. <laughs> and the way that children approach the water, unknown waters, mm -hmm. shallow or deep, they consider it an adventure. They dive in, they're splashing around. And if you could imagine what the adults yeah. did in learning how to swim. They are so nervous that, you know, I have a thing about water, I don't like swimming. Take your time, one foot at a time. I mean, they were terrified of the water. They were terrified of going under. And I think that uh, leadership roles, the future, diving into your own dreams, is about diving in. It's about taking a risk. It's about considering what's unknown and adventure. You might not know all that there is to know. You might not have a whole level of control, uh, but if you fear it, fear will keep you from swimming into waters that can lead you to incredible destiny. Mm -hmm. So my advice to women is always dive in. Take you know, the risk. Take the risk. Yeah. What do you have to lose? And to piggyback off of what Halima said, I go back to my standard philosophy of put on your rhinestone combat boots. Yeah. <laughs> For me, I had to learn that that meant understand who I am and know that my talents, skills, experiences, background, everything that got me to that point is enough to keep me moving forward. And what I don't know at that moment, I'll learn it as long as I stay connected to it. So I say put on your rhinestone combat boots because it's like a mechanism for staying stable and being sturdy, but looking good as you're out there kicking butt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all of you have uh, negotiations in your work life. How do you overcome obstacles negotiating with men, and do you find any obstacles in negotiating with women? And Kim, uh, Kelly, you can start. It's interesting we talk about negotiations because I was talking with my associate yesterday about our future succession and we were getting into some negotiations and I wasn't even thinking we were going to have that discussion yesterday. Um, but I think anytime you have to do any sort of negotiations, whether it's with a male or female, you have to go in there feeling confident and you need to do your homework first and make sure you do your research and know exactly what you're talking about and why you're asking for whatever you're asking for. And like I said, be confident about what you're asking for because if you go in there feeling kind of timid and well, I really think I, you know, I, I think I deserve this. You, you, why do you deserve this? You know, let them know. That I've done X, Y, Z. You know, I've brought so much revenue into the company, or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, you just have to be confident about it. And um, I think, you know, with men, I've, I've mostly dealt in negotiation-wise with men in, in my industry, um, and that's just how I, that's what I've been accustomed to. So I don't really know what the difference is between negotiating with a man versus a female. But I think the the 
work you need to do in advance of it would be the same. It's just, you know, be confident, understand what you're talking about, you know, have, have done the research. And I would say, I, I actually, when my husband and I were buying a new car a couple years ago, uh, I had stopped into the dealership to, to get a quote on what our trade-in would be worth, and all of a sudden I found myself negotiating with the with the dealer on you know buying the car. And I had done all my research in advance, and I walked out of there and I stood firm in my prices. I'm not paying more than you know whatever X Y Z. He's like, oh well, blah blah blah. I'm like, no, I guess what you know the deal is off. And of course they came back around. So if you go in there confident, you know I think that'll be the biggest the biggest smartest thing you can do. A lot of people are shaking their heads, and I take it you all agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, in the book, she talks a lot about success, and everybody has a different version of what is success. But for all of you, has your definition of success changed from when you started your business to as it's matured, to when you started your family, to where your family is now, and to where you thought you'd be at this stage of your life versus where you are? Does the definition of success change as you change? And we're going to start with Helena for this. Yes, my definition of success has completely changed. I think that you know we all can attest if, if any, if all of us in here are over 25, which I'm guessing we are, um, <laughs> that how you consider success. Not you. You, you just turned 21 not too long ago. Like, sure. Might have to card you. Um, the way that you define success at 25 will be different than at 30, right? Different at 40, different at 45. And so with uh, maturity and with age, uh, I, I found that I uh, attributed success to quantity over quality. Like, I wanna make sure that I'm making this much money and I wanna make sure that I have this many clients when it comes to my company. But when you start to consider quality of life, the amount of time you can spend with your family, the legacy that you're leaving in this world, that doesn't have a dollar sign that's attached to it. It doesn't have numbers that are attached to it. But living your best life is not just fulfilling, but it makes an impact to all of the people around you. And as women, you know, we have this gift where we can pass that on to our children. We can invest that into our husbands, our significant others. We can invest that into our projects, and we can invest that into our own companies. Thank you. Cassandra, your thoughts on success, and has your definition changed? It definitely has. Similar to Halima, started off thinking all of the material things, you know, this amount of money, being a millionaire and having the house and buying mama a house and driving this car. And as Halima kept talking, she said something that was very key. She said the L word, legacy. She said legacy. For me, I'm at that stage in my life where I don't have children, yet with what I do with my business, going around the nation, teaching people to become stronger in their careers, and also with the creation of the Wrightwood Ashmore and Overcomers Toastmasters Club as a professional development resource in the greater Ashmore community of Chicago and at the Wrightwood Ashmore Chicago Public Library. That is, as I call it, my baby. That is my legacy. And so for me being involved with the creation of that and the sustaining of that organization and being in the key leadership role for that organization, success is different because it is not just my personal individual success anymore, it's now the success of every member that comes into that club. So it becomes my new definition of success is make it happen. Okay. Make it happen, whatever that it is, make it happen. So because all of you know what success is, even if your definitions have changed, the ultimate question is, can women have it all, all at the same time? What I would like to do with the word all is define <laughs> <laughs> Because all comes with a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I notice that anything I'm a, a accountable for, I actually have to put forth the best effort and accomplish it. And so what all is could be everything. And all could be maybe a small thing. I like to take all in bits and pieces so I can handle it. Because if I get all at the same time, I might not be able to handle it. I'm not saying I'm jumping the gun before I get all. But what I'm saying is I want to be able to handle what all is. 
And of course, I do want a nice big house where I have a maid cleaning the house and a chef in the kitchen cooking and a, a nice car. I, I want a two-seater. I'm tired of driving a family car, big truck. You know, I really want something that I can pull up in and get out with my boots on. And, yeah. and my Visualize. Hat. You know, I want to make sure I have everything that I need and I want a yacht. I want furs in my cold storage. You know what I mean? All is so big, and I do feel that women, we can have it all. If we want it all, we can have it all. You set your goals in place, and you put your markers down. You can have it if you plan it right, if you think it through. Don't just jump and want it all, and you haven't put any planning in it, and you haven't tried to put your thoughts into it. I like to sleep on things. I might have a dream. I'm a dreamer. So I like to sleep on it to see how I'm going to handle all. All is a very important word when you want it all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For those of you that have children as well as a business, how have you managed to have it all, all at the same time? I would say it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. I agree with you. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to have a support system in place. So. I do work full time. I have two young children, three and a half and six and a half. They require a lot of attention and they are very needy the minute I walk in the door at night. Um, so it's helpful to have my spouse, who actually works somewhat opposite schedules than I do half the time, but it's helpful because he can make dinner before he leaves for work. So that, that's mm -hmm. out of my hands. Um, but I'm still having to do bedtime and get them to sleep and then do the laundry and all that. So I, I would say it's hard. I would say. Uh, when I'm at work, I give all, give all at work, and when I'm at home, I try to give all at home. Um, and I try to create some semblance of balance. Uh, I'm lucky in the fact that I do have some flexibility with my schedule so that I can you know, leave work early to take my kids somewhere if I need to. Um, but I would say it's, you know, I would love to have it all and have it all at the same time. But to be honest, I think it's, it's difficult. Thank you. I concur. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking, even though I don't have children, I have a family, you know, my mom always oh, sure. tells me, you know, I wish my oldest daughter would give me some grandchildren. I always have to remind her, you have other children that have given you grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, although I don't have any children, I still understand that with me dating, having a significant other, and then I have my mom, I have my siblings, I have my nieces now, I have my great nieces and nephews, it can't be all about work. And I'm one of those people, when I get focused on the business, that's where my attention is. And whatever else is going on around me, it, unless the house is burning down, I'm not focused on that. <laughs> and I've had to learn over the years, and fortunately I've had good people around me, you know, my mom being one of them, my, my godmother, one of my primary mentors, then another, they've helped me to understand, you can't be so focused on your goal that you forget the people around you. And I say that my Whale Toastmasters Club, they have definitely helped me to understand that where I'm the leader there can be focused on getting the club to its goal and it's an award-winning club. It's a four-time President's Distinguished, two-time District 30 Top 10 Club, two-time Select Distinguished and President. We do a lot of stuff. Apparently. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I can't forget the people. Yeah. I can't forget the people. So it's a balance. And I think when Kathy pointed out, you can set your goals. You can have it all, yet you have to remember to do it in bits and pieces okay. and keep your goal in focus. Okay. Most successful women have mentors. So I want to ask you if you had a mentor or had a mentor, and did you pick her or him, or did they pick you? And what's the biggest lesson you've learned from having a mentor? You can start with me. Oh. Um, I, you know, this is an interesting question because I, this idea of mentorship, uh, you can have a mentor that you look up to. It might not be a positive mentor. It might be that person that you pattern your life after that is closest to you. Um, but in my younger life, the person that I looked up to was not necessarily the most positive person. Mm -hmm. And in my adult life, my mentor, the most powerful part about what she did was help me to unlearn a lot of the things that I had learned from that kind of influence. And I think that that taught me a really powerful lesson and it's that your circle of influence matters to your productivity and how successful you are in life. So my mentor actually chose me. 
uh, while I was working at the Chicago Bulls. The accountant for the Chicago Bulls was, you know, she was just a, a woman that was so amazing to me. An, an incredible wife to her husband, an incredible mother to her daughter, and an incredible executive. And she made everything so simple, every life lesson so simple. And she kept telling me, Helena, your mentor doesn't have to be Oprah Winfrey who you watch on television every day. It could be the receptionist that greets you with a smile that you look up to when you walk into a company. It could be the person at your church that whose life is just such a light to you. Um, and you know, in more of those conversations, she just became the person that I looked up to and she's the person that I talked to about life, about health, about dating, about professional life, all of it. Kathy, do you mentor other people? Yes, I do. I do. I mentor um, other people now, but I had a mentor before that taught me everything I'm doing in the publishing business. She set me down, my mentor, and she gave me a sheet of paper, and she told me everything that I had to do in two weeks. And in two weeks, it was pressure coming on me every time I got ready to accomplish something. And so what she taught me I turn around and teach others. There are sometimes people will pick you and they'll tell you that you are their mentor. And I appreciate that because then I say, oh, since I am a mentor, let me start mentoring you. <laughs> you know, I didn't really realize it, but people will pick you because they admire you and, and they want what you have as far as what you have to offer. What I do is I actually take people not only through the publishing part, but even through videography, uh, public speaking, different things that would enhance someone's life. I like to coach people, get them one-on-one, -on -one, because everyone, you're individuals, you're not the same. And so when I deal with each person, I have to deal with them on an individual basis. And I get to learn who you are and how you do things and let you see your positive side and even taking your negative side and doing something great with it. Because sometimes we look at the negative and it's like, oh, you need to get rid of that. But no, that negative side might be something that is needed to help you when you're dealing with things on your positive side. So mentoring is great, it really is. It helps people to actually get a chance to see who they are. You know, you bring out the qualities in, in a person. Uh, the potential that you have inside is hidden. And sometimes people don't know what their hidden potential is. So when you get a mentor, they're able to go in and dissect and bring out that that was hidden inside of you. There's so much that's inside. And what we do is we deny ourselves. We say, no, that's not me, that's not me. But it's in there and it's waiting and screaming to get out. And it takes a mentor to come along, the ones that are willing to work with you for your ups, your downs. Everyone is not gonna have a good day all the time. Sometimes I have clients that have bad days and what I do with them is I let them vent, I let them get everything out because something that they're saying, I can actually take from it and then astound on it and make them see how great they really are. So Cheryl's book was not without controversy. Um, a lot of people felt that because of the wealth tier that she resides in, it was unfair that she would turn around and say to other women, many who are juggling families and work and not at her income level, that you can have it all and that they should lean in, they should do more, when most of them and most of us can barely get in a shower every day, much <laughs> less lean in. So she got a lot of flack for that. Um, but one of the things that came out of the book that has been really a lifelong thing is the role of men in women's <coughs> lives. And this isn't gonna turn into therapy, got the promise. <laughs> but what do you think men could do, both in work, in our professional lives, as well as at home, to help us get more time so we can lean in? And I'm gonna start with you, Sandra. I think back to my first mentors who were men. Mm -hmm. Something that Kathy pointed out, mentors typically see in you something that will help you to go to that next level mm -hmm. and they help to nurture, cultivate that and pull that out of you even when you don't think you can do that yourself. Most of my mentors have been men. Mm -hmm. 
They help to support me, I say encourage me, push me, challenge me. I had a boss that I worked with for three years who he would tell when I was getting into that comfort zone and Halima talked about taking the risk and he would challenge me with just a word or two, say, hmm, you can't do it. And he would tell me, he, I, he would say, well, okay, watch this. I would tell him, watch this. And, and he knew that was just enough to keep me out of that comfort zone. And I think for men, and I've been blessed that the men that I've, have been in my life that have been my true mentors have really been there to support, advise, guide, direct, and serve as a resource. And I think if men understood that, no matter what their position is, no matter what their titles are, no matter what industries they work in, if they continue to do that and just provide that pathway for women that they work with, that would continue to help. Uh, as far as a spouse, on the other hand, I think I leave that to Kelly. Okay. <laughs> Kelly, you're cute. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I would say, I don't know if it was uh, due to the changing roles of men or he was kind of forced into the role, but my husband had to take on a much more domesticated roles uh, just because of his work schedule. Like I said, he works a lot of nights and would be home with the kids while I was at work, so he didn't have much of a choice but to uh, cook and clean up and do the laundry um, and that's a tremendous help because even with the two of us you know both working and doing things around the house it's still a struggle uh, but I think having that support system and, and believe me we still have issues where I'll be like listen you know like step it up a little bit <laughs> you know, like, I can't do this all on my own um, but communicating with the men in your life, I think, is important, and letting them know, like, if you are feeling like you're drowning, like I can't do all this, you know, at home and at work, mm -hmm. just let them know. And I think, you know, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, you know, hopefully. Um, but they need to be reminded, you know, that it's not just them, and they're not there to cater to them anymore. Especially if you have a family, that was a big, I think, turning point in my marriage. Anyway, it was like, it's not just you and me. I don't take care of you. It's just me. You know, there's four of us now. Mm -hmm. Um, and, that, and that's a big change. So, and, and in the work, I think um, I'm lucky in that the, the gentleman that I do work with, he recognizes, and he told me right when I first started with him, he's like, I, I recognize that you're a mom first, and that's really important. So I think that was awesome, because he gets when I have to stay home with the kids if they're sick or if I need to leave early to take them somewhere. Um, but I think he also recognizes that I, that I am, when I'm at work, you know, fully at work and, and doing what I can. So. I think if men can be a little bit more um, aware of kind of the struggles that women deal with in trying to manage home and work life, that would that would make things a lot easier. Lima, I'm going to have you go out on a limb here because you lean in, right? <laughs> Do you think in your lifetime we'll see 50% of women in corporate boardrooms as CEOs? and having spouses or significant others who do 50% of the child rearing? That's an excellent question. I don't know that I can answer that with a yes or a no. I'll put you on the spot. Only, you know, and it's, it really is a great question because, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, as African Americans, we ask the question, will we ever reach a point where we are equal, like in this world, in terms of, uh, you know, employment, social justice? And there, I mean, we've had hundreds of years of you know this kind of struggle but there are powerful lessons and growth that has come from us not being equal and having to do the work of getting to a point where we have equal access to voting opportunities where we have equal access in the classroom and universities etc cetera, etc cetera. so I mean there is this journey that's always happening with us and with women there is this journey that you know from talking about women's suffrage to you know talking about this this whole idea of what it means for us to lean in and, and really kind of empower yourself in this journey and so I mean I'm not sure I would love for that to be the case you know I, we all would love we all would love it and men would tell you the same thing yeah. you know like this is not just a conversation that we have in, in communities of women uh, but it, I'm sure that your husband you know would say that he, he appreciates you being in a space where uh, he can add value to your life and you, you add value to his but I think that it's a work that we all have to continue to invest in continue to have conversations like this 
and you know I, I love that you asked me that question uh, because just because I you know don't have a, a husband that is is looking to do this kind of 50 percent role and uh, you know just because I might not see myself you know in this book I think that all of our voices are important in this conversation because this is what we're working towards and the last thing that I want to say is you know throughout these questions this question of um, can women have it all right all that set off firestorms yeah. on blogs <laughs> you know like I was introduced to this book not because I went to a bookstore and said I want to get this book mm -hmm. I wanted to know what the controversy was right. about you know and even to this this whole you know kind of a, a question that you know you asked Kathy I don't see myself in this book I don't see myself in this author I don't see myself in the answers to some of these questions but the reason why I love the book is because if we constantly only take gold nuggets and advice from people that look like us have our story relate to what we can relate to then we deny ourselves of the beauty of education in a wide space I received some excellent education from this book from this panel from a bunch of people that do not share in my story mm -hmm. but they share in my perspective that as women women we have to lean in Thank you very much. So let's hear it for our panel, ladies and gentlemen. So now we turn the story over to you. So does anybody have a question either for all the panelists or a panelist by name? Uh, please talk as loudly as you can so everyone can hear the question. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I was just thinking about you saying, can women have it all? Equality. But do we really want to be equal to men? I mean, we're equal in the sense that we're humans, okay? That's equality. But there are some things that men do that I don't want to do. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's just like with my husband. I mean, in a lot of, you know on a sexual level, not, I mean, just being a woman, yes. the feminine part of it. I like my husband to empty the garbage. Yes. I don't want to empty the garbage, yes. okay? I like him to go out and shovel the snow. And you know, those are... F the, the bigger question there is whether you like to take out the garbage or he does or how that works out. Well, that's Do true. you want to be paid the same amount of money for doing the same job a man Of does? course, in that sense, yes. I want my knowledge to be recognized that I am equal to men, okay? And as a woman, I know we do not get that worth. For example, my daughter, she's an <coughs> event planner. She had to leave Chicago to find a job in event planning. She went all the way to California and within two weeks, she had five positions that were offered to her. So I think depending on your ethnicity, depending on your self-confidence and leaning in or just knowing your worth will put you on that path. And, and if I could respond to that, you know, I, 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 I have two things to say to that. You know, the first thing I find myself, because I'm not a person that wants to see a world of complete equality. Yeah. I like when someone offers to help me with my groceries when I'm walking down the street and he feels like he should because I mean, I'm not offended by that, and that's just a personal thing, you know, for me. But when it comes to employment opportunities, when it comes to educational opportunities, you know, these are, are things that I think we all would like to yeah. see uh, equality for. But to your end point, you know, I think sometimes we restrict ourselves. I think sometimes we limit ourselves. Sometimes we say, well, you know what, based on your ethnicity, you can have certain things. Or because I'm a woman, mm -hmm. you know, I can, I should only want these things. Mm -hmm. But I think that we have to take those restrictions off of our minds because if we don't, then we will end up discriminating against other women. Mm -hmm. We will end up creating policies in the workplace uh, based on a very limited idea of, of what it means to embrace diversity. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Mine is more of a statement than a question, but it's kind of a, a combination of both. Each one of you women uh, is just a little, ask, it seems like you're just an offshoot of a different part of me. Um, 
I'm going into my third business now. I'm an international person, but my background is medical, and I started a medical equipment and supply company right here in Chicago, but I live in Virginia. And I'm international as well, so I'm more like the lady here. Is, is that Salima? Halima. 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 Okay. Halima. Halima. Uh, in, in that aspect. So there are some things that that I can see in my business with um, battered women. I'm working with battered women um, in four different nations as well as here. And so we also have an international aspect to go along with that. That'll that'll be more therapy and also teach them entrepreneurship within that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Cassandra. Cassandra. Cassandra, because I wasn't hearing very well here. It's too bad you didn't have microphones. You know, so um, I want to know some things that I can do on an international scene, you know, with the women that I work with. Um, and at the same time, do something medical with that as well. So <coughs> we're looking to do a charitable cruise you know, to raise support for them because we're not a, a nonprofit. We're, a, our, we're setting up an L3C uh, for that. And so for that international connection, I want to uh, be able to connect with uh, Halima and Cassandra, is that? Okay, Cassandra. Um, Cassandra, is a, she seems like a person who um, has a lot of different aspects in terms of her background and in terms of what she's doing now. Each one of you seem to bring to the table um, some entrepreneurial skills that it doesn't seem like you had before now. Is that correct? Am I correct to assume that? I think, they, I think they were always there. I think yeah. all of you. I, I say they were there before, maybe just simmering a little bit into the instances and challenges. I think for all of us, to, right? They were, cooking, they were cooking, but instances and life experiences helped to bring them to the surface. So I think we all were entrepreneurial in spirit. We may not have been doing that initially at first. Okay. I was always a take charge person. Yes. Even as a little girl, I took care of everyone. I made sure I came in if people needed food. I was the one preparing food. I cleaned the house because I didn't want a messy house. I was always to take charge and to manage, to bring money into the house so that it could be dispersed properly. That was me. So I always had a business side to me, but I just didn't know what to do with it. And then when I stepped into being um, the president of the publishing company, I said, wow, I was doing this all along. I just didn't know what I was doing it before. So it's great that you're dealing with battered women. And when dealing with battered women, you're, you're dealing with women and we want to make sure they don't hate men. We want to make sure they don't look down on men. We want to put the battered women in a, in a state of mind that it maybe was that particular but we can't group men in one big circle. All men are the same, and this is how they are. You know, that's a really uh, wonderful thing you're doing to deal with battered women. Um, so you're saying you're doing it internationally, all over the world? Well, I spent um, nine and a half years in 10 countries working with battered women over there. Mm. Um, but it actually started here. It started here in Chicago mm -hmm. uh, back in the 1970s. And it's not a part of my background. My background is medical, and I like math like you. <laughs> but so, <laughs> so um, but I wanted to do something for battered women because I was a battered child. And it was my grandfather who was my mentor, and he rescued me as well. So everyone kept pushing me in that direction, saying, you need to do something with battered women because you're already doing it. So I still don't have an educational background to do that. but. Um, they always come to me, and so I just want to be ready, you know, to give an answer and the hope that I believe in, you know, because our, our organization is holistic. So we look at not only the natural, but the supernatural as well, naturally, <coughs> physically, emotionally, as well as spiritually. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Robin. misconceptions and misperceptions and uh, Cassandra you 
mentioned trading likability for um, respectability. And I was just curious, um, there is a, a point where you come in, as, as you mentioned, Halima, saying, I'm prepared, I'm ready, and I'm going to convince you, that you can also alienate, one, one one can, especially women, it seems, can alienate people and be perceived as um, aggressive and haughty or, and, and women can respond to them in, in particular, in different, different ways. And I was just wondering, not only women, but men. And I was just wondering if you, you had experiences with that that you could share. Um, I know you definitely mentioned some Cassandra with your rhinestone boots. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if there are, if there is advice you have for distinguishing being prepared and be having that will to succeed versus being perceived as aggressive and um, alienating. Well, I, I will say that sometimes that's not something that you can control. I do the best that I can to not say to you that I'm going to convince you, but allow what I produce to, you know, speak for me outside of, of my own voice. I don't think that it's effective to go into a boardroom and say all of you are going to respect me before this meeting is over. <laughs> you know, but what you want to do is making sure that what your outcome and your what you what you put out there and your finished product and the work that you do speaks volumes for who you are. And I have had many instances where I've been told that I'm hard to work with because I say no or because I'm not willing um, to uh, allow uh, you know people to not respect myself my brand or the company that I work for and so in those instances you find that it's not much that you can do you know people have the perception that mm -hmm. you know if, if, if you are a B or C then you should behave as a B or C and you know they kind of put you in that box and if you want to break out of that box then again what you put out there and what you produce has to speak louder than your own words and just be you know I just work to try to be a woman of integrity and not beat people over the head with things and if they don't come around then those might not be you know clients that I work with on the long haul but you know the hope is is that you know they'll at least have respect for your position and Robin I have to agree and it is Robin correct mm -hmm. yeah. I have to agree with what Halima said about being able to produce the results mm -hmm. that you bring to the table at the end of the day that's what people will remember most about you being to do what you said you would do and being able to bring things to the table yet I would also say consider the industry that you're in as well I know for me with my career I started as an administrative assistant working at a nonprofit foundation there were only four of us and I was the only woman and I had to learn quickly working in that environment men do things differently than women and then I left there and went to a law association where I worked for five years. And again, male dominated. So I was primarily for those eight years in corporate America in a male dominated environment. So I've been called aggressive. I've been called the B word. I've been called some other things as well. Yet I've had to learn, and also this comes into the patterning of having the mentors where the mentors can also assist. I had to become very aware when I got to that law association, which is where I had that coworker within the first two days, she immediately didn't like me because she felt I thought I knew so much. No, I was confused. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know who to talk to, and she was my point person. But she did not like the direct way in which I communicated. I asked for what I want. I expect an answer. That's how I was always communicating in my previous environments. I had to unlearn, and I don't want to say that I completely unlearned it, I had to learn to soften that in that environment when I was working with some women because they were not accustomed to that without losing who I was and how I operated as a professional. Because at the end of the day, my boss was looking to me to get certain things done and he didn't care if she talked to me or not. He wanted that project, that assignment completed. So I had to learn to get around her after I had a face-to-face, one-on-one conversation with her and just let her know that I don't dislike you, I dislike what I saw you do, but since you're really not going to be willing to assist me in my newness here of the company, that I appreciate you not doing that because now it's going to teach me a new way of learning. And I, and I had to learn to soften it, find new mentors, find new resources, but also realize that it's industry. This industry. I was now becoming more in contact with other women 
whereas I was the only woman. Thank you all, and thank you for your questions, audience. Um, I'd like to thank our panel for appearing here tonight, for sharing um, your generosity of spirit, your creativeness, your resourcefulness. So let's hear it for the panel. Profit organization called leanin.org and one of the first things that they're doing is coupling with the Getty Images company and these are people that provide all those advertisements those photographs you see on buses on print and they and Cheryl is going to supply uh, photographs of women of diversity uh, in empowered positions so that we can get rid of the old stereotype of woman. I mean, if you, any of you watch television and see commercials, it's the same old story like it was in the 1950s. It really hasn't changed that much. Um, so what she's hoping is that by changing the visuals, people will start seeing women in a different capacity, the way they want to be seen. She's also hoping that by encouraging other women to lean in, that the pay inequity that's haunted us for at least 50 years finally goes away in this generation of young women. And also that women start becoming more supportive of each other because though it's great to have men who have had strong careers and can lead you in a certain way, it's even better when you have another woman who can help you. So our last thought tonight is may you all go out and lean in as much as you can and help other women do the same. Thank you all. For your